So I've been told to get going with the next, next session. So I will introduce the faculty moderator first. Dr. John Bodell is the W. Dunkman Macmillan II Professor of Classics and Professor of History here at Brown University. Professor Bodell's research has primarily focused on ancient Roman social, economic, and cultural history, Latin epigraphy and literature, Roman religion and funerary practices, and ancient slavery. A few examples of his current and forthcoming work include studies of Roman tomb gardens, Roman slave names, Roman muleteers and the organization of Roman land transport, and examinations of death and social death in ancient Rome, which look at Roman perceptions of the condition of slavery. Since 1995, he has also directed the US Epigraphy Project, which is aimed at creating an XML-based search engine, photographic archive, and online database of the over 3,500 ancient Greek and Latin inscriptions found within the United States. And we have our two presenters. Mick Larson is a doctoral student at UCLA. He completed his undergraduate studies in history and classics at the University of Southern California. Mick received the Eugene Cota Robles Fellowship at UCLA and is currently writing a dissertation on poverty in the Roman world. Then we have Catherine P.D. Humiller, who is a doctoral student at Princeton University in the program In the Ancient World within the Department of Classics. Prior to coming to Princeton, she worked in the nonprofit sector in Washington, D.C. on women's health and economic issues, completed the post-baccalaureate program at Georgetown University, and earned her BA from Middlebury College. Catherine is currently writing her dissertation on the various ways in which the Roman slave system exploited the sexuality of slaves and the effect of this exploitation on the free and enslaved communities. So please welcome our speakers and our moderator. Mm -hmm. Thank you. OK, uh, hello. Um, I'd like to preface this presentation uh, by saying that it's part of a larger project on the representation of poverty uh, in the Roman world and that it concerns one particular mode of representation, which was not certainly the only mode of representation, but one critical to imagining how concepts of citizenship and its important varied starkly across class lines. Um, so first I'll provide a quick rundown of the particulars of Roman slavery and citizenship for those who may not be so familiar with Roman society, uh, and then argue in my paper that Roman elites frequently seized opportunities to narrow or erase the barrier between slaves and free citizens. Uh, and then to attempt explanations as to why. All right. Social structure in Roman society rested upon several dichotomies which provided the pillars of status and interaction, free and slave, patron and client, citizen and non-citizen, to which we might also add man and, man and woman. The markers which indicated in which of these groups you belonged would be apparent to everyone you knew, your name, your clothing, your interpersonal relationships, even the rings you wore. Your relation to these dichotomies also dictated your position on a scale of dependence, that is, your proximity and relationship to citizenhood, personal freedom, or slavery. The dichotomies I mentioned can serve as a quick primer on divisions within Roman society and persisted throughout much of Roman history. All right. At the top of the heap were full citizens who enjoyed special legal rights and tax exemptions. And here we have the uh, social pyramid of Gesal Foldi and is the social history of Rome, which is more or less accurate um, and so at the bottom of the pyramid, we have the plebs or fauna and the plebs rustica, that is, people who are not in the aristocracy who are of the city and around the country. Right? Uh, we have slaves here in the center, and we have liberty here, but also encroaching upon this upper pyramid, which is the emperor at the very top and the senatorial and equestrian orders, that is, the aristocracy of the Roman world in this upper pyramid. All right. So. Uh, so free non, at the top of the heap were full citizens. They had special legal rights and tax exemptions. Free non-citizens, of which there were many, had none of these perks. Placed in a separate category were freedmen, the liberty here, uh, former slaves who had been freed by their master through various forms of manumission. When freed, they would gain citizenship if their master was a citizen, and their children would also be free, full citizens. They would take their master's name as part of their own and legally owe their master's service, duty, and deference uh, legally, officium et operai et obsequium for the rest of their lives. This practice replicated, to a degree, the details of the relationship between master and slave. Finally, there were the slaves themselves, who filled a variety of roles, from farm labor and mine workers to skilled professionals, such as teachers, orators, and doctors. Many were ultimately freed, the majority were not. Precise numbers are nearly impossible to recover. <laughs> 
Uh, I might also add that slavery did not have a racial component in the Roman world. Uh, people of any ethnicity could become and did become slaves, including Italians and Romans themselves. Outright manumission comprised only one of the methods which provided avenues for shifting between freedom and slavery. A tremendous problem of the Middle Republic, that is the third and fourth centuries BC, was tension over nexum, a practice wherein men sold themselves into debt slavery. Even after nexum was abolished, men could temporarily become addicti, that is temporarily indentured servants. Couple this with various forms of manumission, and it becomes clear that Rome had a variety of social mechanisms by which people were constantly transitioning from one status to another, in and out of slavery and citizenship. Now, when it comes how, to how they thought about themselves, Romans from the ground up proved incredibly status conscious. The gravestones and funeral art of slaves, freedmen, and laborers at the bottom of the social ladder consistently pronounced their status and occupation. And here we have a slide with examples of Roman funerary epigraphy um, and some actual tombstone art. So here we have something from, uh, which simply says Zena Copus. The name Zena and Copus, her occupation, cook. That is all that survives to commemorate this person. She was most likely of slave origin considering her name and her occupation. The work that she did is more than half of her commemorative space. Here at the bottom, we have a much longer uh, commemorative inscription uh, by the freed woman Maitia Nipe, which not only tells that she is a freed woman, and she broadcasts that to whoever's reading it, but also her relationship to her patron and to other freed men and freed women in her, in her uh, social circle, and that she made it for herself, and that she paid it for it, which could have taken a substantial amount of money. Um, and it's a, very, it's a very interesting way of looking into a, like a complex social world. Now here for the picture, we have the famous tomb of Eurosophis the Baker, who was a freed man. Now the interesting thing about this megalith is that it's weird design. Uh, some think that it emulates Baker's ovens. So like the occupation and the labor of his life is replicated in the form of the tomb itself. And if you look on these reliefs, which you probably can't see from distance, uh, they are reliefs of people who are making bread, that they are performing labor in this kind of public space. All right, so an individual's place, free, slave, or citizen, and Mike Nike is probably a citizen as a freed woman, um, oh, okay. Sorry, I lost that. Oh, yes. Uh, an individual's, individual's place, free slave or citizen, clearly played a large role in the formulation and of expression of identity, especially to those who had undergone a status transition during their own lifetime. But from the vantage point of Roman elites, the sharply drawn lines between freedom and slavery, citizen and foreigner, frequently faded away in text. And we could read this in the written text they produce. One must note at this juncture that when we talk about the Roman texts, nearly every text we possess, despite whether or not they depict the poor, freedmen, or slaves in an apparently realistic manner, comes from an elite pen and an elite mind, coming from their insular world where questions of citizen identity meant something less for nearly every elite was free and a citizen. Images of life at the bottom often blurred the line between citizen and slave. Elite authors repeatedly equate the two groups or present them as practical or explicit equals. This paper will investigate how slaves and the citizen poor could be assimilated together in the Roman elite imagination and attempt to explain how this viewpoint came to exist. One factor which resulted in elites imagining slaves and the free poor as indistinguishable was that both groups participated in an activity which elites did not understand and never participated in, and that was labor. Labor, in the English sense of the word, was alien to the established aristocracy. No nobleman would ever work with his hands or commit himself to an hourly wage. Physical work that involved the body also represented an antithesis to the intellectual pursuits which the elite thought of as their special preserve. Manual labor was, however, the preserve of the poor and of slaves, and the burden these two status groups shared could result in Roman elites seeing the two groups as practically indistinguishable. In the novelist Apuleius's Metamorphoses, a poor free farmer performs tasks such as digging, watering, and other heavy labor, actions which the narrator explicitly describes as servitude, huius quoque servitii mei, bolded and underlined it here. Uh, it's worthwhile here to point out that despite the narrator being in the position of the slave, at this point in the text he has been transformed into a donkey and is serving his free master, uh, he attributes servitude to both himself and the free master that they perform together. Considering that elites could see the distance between manual and intellectual work as a fundamental distinction between themselves and the lower classes, it is unsurprising that we can see them categorizing such classes together. 
the orator Cicero states in his On Duties, or De Officiis, that, quote, all occupations that involve labor are sordid and unworthy for free men whose sweat but not skill is hired out. In this field is truly the wages of slavery, ipsa merces actoramentum servitutis. All men who build things work in shameful jobs, and workshops have nothing of the free born in them. In terms of the phrase, the wages of slavery, the very fact of these people earning money for their work, what one might imagine defining them as free, instead contributes to the notion of their servility. Even outside of specifically manual work, palpable elite bias against wage laborers comes into play. Free people who engage in work associated with slaves, teaching, for instance, were often met with the same sort of disdain. The essayist Lucian of Samosata complained about the servitude implicit in working in a generally servile trade as a free man in his unsalaried posts when he worked as a teacher. Having a salary was a bad thing. Free men, especially those raised in comparative opulence, felt that a permanent job restricted their freedom of choice and constrained them like slaves. As seen in Cicero's concern about the wages of slavery, and possibly in Lucian's concern about bending to his employer's demands, Elie Eyes posited labor as not just indicative of servitude, but also as an influence on one's moral character. They are sordid and, present not, and possess not their free will. Aristocratic men, on the contrary, saw themselves as beyond the lure of money, as they were protected by their wealth, but imagined the poor to be easily corrupted by it and thus inherently morally suspect. As men who could be bought for wages, the poor lacked the capacity for independent moral virtue and incorruptibility that the elite possessed. By working for other men, poor men belonged to other men, selling themselves into continual slavery. We can see how aristocrats created examples of this behavior in the popular imperial genre of declamation. That is, practice judicial themes on which upper class students and legal professionals would give extemporaneous speeches for show. Surviving declamatory topics include ones about a rich young man who gives a poor young man money to kill a tyrant, which happens, and multiple ones describing poor men who sell or pimp out their wives to rich men because of money. The message of these texts is clear. The irresistible lure of money makes the poor men and their wives beholden to the rich, similar in fact to the historical political strategy of elite Romans buying elections from the poor. Wealth carries the perk of free will and poverty carries the obligation of servility. Elite authors never express this principle more clearly than when they describe other elites in danger of losing their political rights or special economic status. The annals of the historian Tacitus describe how the emperor Nero enticed uh, impoverished former aristocrats into humiliating themselves on stage because their poverty made them corruptible. Egestate venales in scynem deduxit. Elsewhere, he depicts supporters of the doomed emperor Otho flattering him, not out of fear or affection, but from their love of servitude, ex libidine servitii. Each had its private motivations. The public well-being was held as worthless. For the obsequious senators, the health of the community and their personal dignity are superseded by the willingness to kowtow to others in search of a reward and the hope of retaining their privileged position. This theme, the susceptibility to suggestion of people on the edge, transfers over to, over to texts which discuss people farther down on the social ladder. The satires of Juvenal repeatedly include episodes of poor freed men and dependents willfully debasing themselves in the hopes of a paltry financial or culinary reward. Obviously, the poverty a senator might suffer differs from that of the man on the street, but the same principle holds, and in general, the authors describe them in the exact same terms. The connection between the free, poor, and slaves in Roman elite thought does not emerge merely in discussions of labor or morality, but also in specific textual instances where the two groups are explicitly or implicitly equated. Texts re repeatedly mention the poor and slaves in close proximity, grouped together, actors in concord. Uh, the historian Livy mentions the poor plebs and slaves in the same breath, servitiorum utique et plebis, as victims of an oncoming famine. They, defined together by their economic status at the bottom of the heap, will suffer the same fate, starvation, as the result of their proximal social position. On a different note, Juvenal, the satirist, repeatedly describes poor citizens in terms analogous to slaves, but not always merely because of social position. Instead, neglect from their elite patrons, who should take care of them, reduces them to pseudo-servitude. A shunned freedman client in juvenile protests that I am thrust from my patron's door and all my long years of servitude, longi servitii, go for nothing. The author here 
does not see fit to distinguish whether the years, the long years, apply to his original slave status, as he was a freed man, he was a slave before, or his later officium, that is the duty which I mentioned earlier, which he owes to his patron as a free citizen client, or both. We might think of them here as blurred together by the exigencies of his situation. While another episode in Juvenal predicts that a hopeful client will offer his head to be shaved, that is a slave hairstyle, and will endure the whip, that is endure beatings like a slave, in order to remain in his master's good graces. The first character here, in line with the earlier description of a freed man's obligation to his master, verbally expresses his connection to his patron in terms of servitude, servitii, which a free person would not do. The second will proceed even further, that is, in being shaved and being beaten, in order to secure favor, enduring physical punishment and mimicking a slave's physical appearance, willfully transitioning himself from the image of one status to that of another. Now the other, more sinister aspect to equating slaves and the free poor happens when our texts intimate that these groups represent a constant and present danger to the integrity, both moral and actual, of the traditional Roman state. The aforementioned historian Livy narrates the elite Roman response to the attempted uprising of Turnus Herdonius in the early Republic in exactly these terms. The consuls were afraid about whether to arm the plebs or to leave them unarmed, being uncertain about what sudden disaster, external or internal, would invade the city from the hatred of the plebs or slavish deceit. They tried to settle the tumult, but only increased it, nor could the terrified and indignant multitude be controlled by authority. At last, they distributed arms, not to the crowd, but only the amount necessary to provide security for everything with the enemy unknown. The unknown enemy here being clearly linked to tension between one group, that is the elites, and another, the plebs plus slaves. The elite fear presented as wholly justified and reinforced by the final comment that the Senate was unwilling to arm the entire populace has as its object, quote, hatred from the lower classes or from the trickery of slaves, ob odio plebis on ob sir willy fraude. The two lower orders of society thus paralleled are shown to be equally capable of disruption to the composer of the state, and only when the true source of the discord is revealed does the aristocracy slowly abandon their suspicions of the poor. Likewise, the historian Tacitus mentions chronically misbehaving mobs and groups of the poor, a serious cause of urban unrest and of support for wicked emperors in his histories side by side with slaves. And here we have it here. The poorest of the plebs and the worst of the slaves were there together to freely betray their wealthy masters, who are, I suppose, the heroes of the story. All right, that should be the last slide. We go back. Previous. Huzzah. My conclusion concerns why Roman elites would willfully lump together classes who, as we've seen, were themselves hypersensitive to questions of status. The question, and perhaps the explanation, lies in the degree to which the aristocracy saw the free poor as a legitimate threat to their social position and power. In terms of military might and the capacity for violence, the poor posed the rich no significant threat, as even when slave revolts and other great disruptions occurred, as with Turnus or Donius, the citizen poor of Rome by and large stayed peaceful and loyal to the regime. One likely factor derives from a resilient elite anxiety about lower classes subverting the traditional power and political rights of the aristocracy, an anxiety paralleled by the backlash against upwardly mobile freedmen during the early empire, a few of whom usurped roles traditionally held by rich ancestors. And if we look back at Alfoldi's diagram, we notice that the freedmen in the center, as part of the familia sedaris, as part of the household of the emperor himself, have made a dent in the upper pyramid of aristocratic power. Um, that's a great part of this particular diagram. In fact, there are no women on it is a problem a different problem. The free poor consistently posed a potential, if almost never actualized, threat to the privileged place of the nobility, either as supporters of demagogues during the Republic or as devotees of populist-minded emperors thereafter. Treating lower status groups as essentially servile allowed elites a method of facing their fears about the political threat posed by the subaltern classes. Tacitus, as earlier, provides a fine example of this when he uses accusations of servility to disparage the followers of emperors he personally dislikes, not a few of them. Along the way, this image of the poor as essentially servile, tied to labor, unable to exercise ethically pure decision making because they were not their own, and disruptive to the serenity of the state, justified denying the free poor political representation or serious consideration of their political cachet. 
a cachet that everyday Romans well understood, and which they in fact often used their, to their advantages in public affairs, i.e. interactions with the emperor at public events where there would be a give and take between crowd and ruler. By understating the distances between the citizen poor and slaves, elites presented their conglomeration as a chaotic, undisciplined mob rather than the self-aware, vibrant, and politically potent communities they actually were. Thank you. Hello. I know that I'm the last panel of the day talk, so you're probably a little sleepy. Thank you for hanging in there. And um, I think this is actually going to, I have to congratulate you because this is such a well put together panel. It's going to be really interesting to compare our two papers because I am also talking about the dividing line between the free and enslaved in Rome. And while Mick talks about the blurring of this line, I'm talking about aspects that, ideologically speaking, divided them. Whether they divided them in actuality is something I hope to look at further in my dissertation. So to hold your attention, I'm going to start with a nice story. And I even have a picture for you to further hold your attention. And this is a Botticelli painting from 1500 showing the story of Virginia. It's a, a narrative starting here and continuing to this side, chronologically. So way back in the early days of Rome, there was a tyrannical Roman magistrate named Appius Claudius, who lusted after a beautiful free maiden named Virginia. But since she's a free maiden, he can't touch her. So he devises a plan to get her. So on the, in the first scene on your far left, We see one of Appius' associates, minions, sees Virginia by claiming that she is not freeborn, but actually the daughter of one of his slaves, and thus a slave herself. In the next scene in the middle, we see a trial for Virginia's status, slave or free, with her father and her betrothed pleading for her freedom. Unfortunately for Virginia, Appius is the magistrate presiding over the trial, so it won't surprise you that he rules that Virginia is a slave. Now in the last scene, before Virginia is dragged off, her father requests a last word. Instead of embracing her, he pulls out a sword and slays her. And he says to those gathered around him, in the words of the Roman historian Livy, his daughter's life was dearer to him than his own, had she been allowed to live free and chaste. But when he saw her dragged off to be raped as a slave girl, he thought it better to lose his child by death than by dishonor. Virginia's father makes explicit in words what the plot has suggested. Freeborn citizens were protected from sexual assault, but slaves were not. This story is mythical and hopefully not historical, but it tells us much about how Romans perceived slavery, and in particular, as Mick talked about, the difference between the enslaved and the free. Because as we've just talked about, all of slaves in Roman society shared a legal status, but they couldn't be distinguished from the free population by other shared markers like race, ethnicity, language, education, economic status, or even the type of labor they performed. And as you said, we also find enormous disparity in the lived experience of Roman slaves. So with such variance, we have to ask, what in the ideology of Roman slavery separated the free from the enslaved? According to Virginia's story, one important factor is corporal autonomy. Reduced to slave status, Virginia immediately becomes vulnerable, stripped of all that had formerly protected her. Her citizenship, her freeborn status, her legal familial relationships to her male relatives, her betrothal to a Roman citizen, and furthermore, according to this tradition, because remember she was claimed as a slave by one of Appius's friends, not by Appius himself, she's sexually available not only to her master, but to others as well whether that be society at large or those that her master permitted. This 
bodily autonomy of the free person and the corresponding vulnerable vulnerability of the slave is found um, in nearly every other literary genre and in many other of these sort of foundational historical myths of early Rome. So I'm giving you just two examples of the sort of thing I'm talking about. First, the poet Horace. When you swell with desire and there's a young slave girl or boy ready at hand whom you could jump right away, you don't prefer to burst, do you? I certainly don't. I like sex that is easy and obtainable. In a very different genre, we find in the historian Livy that rape is described as a characteristically servile experience. A noble woman captured in war is raped by a Roman centurion. Livy writes, at first he tried her disposition. When he found it shrinking from voluntary sex, he did violence to her body, which fortune had made a slave. I ask today what another type of evidence, Roman legal sources, specifically the opinions of jurists collected in the Digest, a sixth century compilation of classical, mostly classical Roman law. What can these sources tell us about the corporal and specifically sexual autonomy and vulnerability of the slave in the Roman mind? Previous scholarship on the sexual assault of slaves has used the ideology presented in these literary sources as a model. And the current consensus is that the legislation on illicit sex in Rome reinforced this existing social dichotomy by creating two groups, one whose sexual honor was protected, Virginia pre-slave, and one who was denied any sexual honor at all. And that included non-citizen foreign, foreigners, um, slaves, and those in certain pr professions like prostitutes who were often slaves but not exclusively. It was, this line of reasoning goes, only through the exploitation of the latter group that the sexual honor of the former group could be protected. Access to slaves and others served as a sort of safety valve for excess sexual energy, and importantly, this access was codified in Roman law. While this view has its merits, it focuses on social relations on a large scale and doesn't engage with aspects specific to a slave society. The dynamics of the master-slave relationship the master's proprietary interest in the slave, and the authority and autonomy of the slave, the master, over his household. We can more clearly understand these laws connected to sexual exploitation if we consider how they function within the slave system. And it's true that a master's sexual access to his own slaves was for the most part unrestricted, as we find in most historical periods of slavery. But what differs in these various forms of slavery is the master's interest in the slave's sexual contact with others. And Roman law offered multiple ways in which a master could control access to his slaves. And I should state here that I'm going to refer to the master as male because that's usually the case in our evidence, but we also have plenty of evidence of female masters exhibiting some of the same methods of control. Similarly, in Rome, both male and female slaves were sexually exploited but female slaves appear most frequently as victims in the legal sources. So I'm going to usually refer to the victim as female. Of particular interest today are the various remedies available to a master whose slave has been violated by a third party. These are all forms of delict and resulted in monetary compensation. And they range from a charge of property damage to corruption of a slave to dignitary injury to the master, and there are other options that we won't even discuss today, including theft and kidnapping. When discussed by modern historians, these charges are described as property violations. That's definitely true, but I think they can tell us quite a bit more. As I lay out three of these possible legal remedies for sexual violation, I will seek to offer a more nuanced understanding of how the sexual exploitation of slaves was accommodated and shaped by the legal system by answering the following questions. Is the slave's status decisive for the legal remedy, or is the rape of a free person covered by the same law? What is the perceived nature of the violation and nature of the harm? And what is the link between a slave's sexual experience and a slave's value? You will note that 
the answers to these questions vary among the available actions in sometimes contradictory ways. In part, this is due to the fact that slaves themselves have a very contradictory nature in Roman law. They are both persons and property and appear in the context of offenses against both categories. Obviously, the concerns relating to an offense against property, such as the market value of a damaged object, were necessarily different than the concerns relating to an offense against a person. But these, this mul multiplicity and these contradictions, while perhaps due more to the nature of Roman law than some sort of purposeful planning, were nonetheless useful for the slave system. Rather than imposing one version of a slave's sexual honor or lack thereof, the law left it up to the owner to decide how he wanted to divine, define the value of an individual slave's sexuality. The system thus gave the Roman master maximum autonomy, offering but not mandating remedies for those who chose to place a value on their slave's sexual integrity. I turn now to three of the possible charges, all mentioned in this passage from the Digest, which compares the law available to rape for free persons and the law available in the case of female slaves. These charges can be viewed on a spectrum with the slave as property on one end and the slave as a person to a certain degree on the other. Starting on the property end, the sexual violation of a slave could be conceived of as property damage. The legal action covered damage, originally killing but later extended to burning, spoiling, breaking, certain types of particularly valuable property, including trees, farmhouses, certain types of livestock. This offense is explicitly described in financial terms. For an act to fall in the, this category, it must result in not just injury, but actual damage. The property must have been made, and I quote, less valuable or less useful. One way a slave could be made less valuable was through defloration. Virginity was a physical state that increased a slave's value, and this value is construed in straightforward economic commercial terms as the slave's price on the market, rather than any more subjective value based on the slave's relationship to or utility for the owner. This law of damage deals mostly with physical injury. But the second charge on our list, the action for the corruption of a slave, dealt with damage to a slave's character. I would say this law falls in the middle of my spectrum. It punished those who made a slave worse. Examples include convincing a slave to run away, to commit a crime, to buy luxury items. It also included persuading a slave to be a lover, submit to sexual advances, or do unchaste things. A key commonality between all of these actions may be that they serve to alienate the slave from the owner. The slave is either acting in his or her own interests or that of a third party rather than in the interests of the owner. In this law, we see recognition of a slave as a human, one capable of acting independently and one that has unique individual character that's revealed through his actions. In some cases, the original nature of the slave and the slave's related standing in the household should determine the level of damage done. One jurist urges a judge hearing the case of a virgin that has been deflowered or the violation of a male slave to consider the prior nature of the slave in question. If the perversion of this slave's nature will have consequences not just for the slave himself but for the entire household, the case should be judged more severely. So we see that the sexual integrity of some slaves is linked to their mental character and is more valuable than that of others, probably for a range of reasons from their function in the household to possibly a familiar or otherwise close relationship with the master. And yet, while the law attributes certain essential human qualities to the slave, these qualities are deemed relevant only in the context of determining the monetary value of the slave. One jurist explains why the law for the corruption of a slave cannot be applied to the corruption of free people. This edict does not apply to the case of a son or daughter who has been made worse because the action has been established specifically to deal with making worse a slave who is part of one's estate, in which case the owner can prove that he is financially worse off 
although the dignity and reputation of his household remain unimpaired. So while it is recognized that both the enslaved and the free have a character that is capable of being corrupted, the effect of this corruption is different. The perversion of a slave's character devalues the slave and thereby affects the monetary value of an owner's estate, but it does not affect the social standing of the household. But this formulation is hard to reconcile with the rationale behind the third available law, one sitting at the human end of our spectrum, and that is the law of injury. Inactive injury was one which affected the aforementioned dignity and reputation of a person. It's originally intended for retribution for physical harm, but it came to cover any act that caused dignitary harm. So that could be a slap in the face, or it could be defamatory speech. And importantly, a head of the household could be insulted directly or derivatively through an insult to a member of his larger family, his wife, his child, or his slave. The sexual assault, in fact, just the attempted sexual assault of anyone in the family was thus construed as an injury to the dignity of the head of the household. <coughs> and it's worth reading this in full to note how his wor the juris wording emphasizes the equivalence of the crime regardless of the identity or status of the victim. If anyone tries to make someone unchaste, woman or man, freeborn or freed, a charge of injury applies. Even if the chastity of a slave is threatened, there is a place for the charge of injury. Of course, for the chastity of slaves to be threatened, they must be conceived of as having chastity to begin with. It seems that the construction of slaves as the viable members of society in opposition to the inviable free persons did not preclude slaves from having the quality of chastity, a quality which in fact added to a slave's value. That's sexual experience might make a slave less valuable is made explicit in other places in which the value of a slave is in question. For instance, if a slave sale is found to be con uh, conducted improperly and is invalidated, the purchaser must pay the seller for any reduction of the slave's value, mental or physical, that occurred while the slave was in his possession. One example includes the violation of a female slave. An epigram of the Roman poet Marshall makes the same connection between a slave's sexual experience and value. A slave dealer is trying to auction a slave who is known to have acted as a prostitute. She's such a, such a one as those that sit in the middle of the Sabura. Wishing to prove to all that she was clean, since for a long time the bids were low, he drew her close to him, note against her will, and kissed her twice and thrice and again. You ask what that kissing accomplished? Somebody who was bidding 600 sesterces withdrew. His plan obviously backfires. He's made her unchaste, in fact. Not to mention she's associated with a slave dealer who is not a particularly moral figure in the Roman world. It's clear from the number of remedies available to the owner of a violated slave, which I've only discussed three here, that the sexual integrity of slaves was not a non-issue. Sexual experience impacted in various ways and degrees the slave's physical and mental character, and thus the economic and social standing of the master. If a master chose to prostitute or otherwise use sexually his own slave, he risked reducing the value of his estate. And perhaps even, if he chose to buy into this connection between a slave's sexual integrity and an owner's reputation, the honor of his household. But that was his prerogative, not a concern of the law. And it was always possible that the money earned from prostitution might outweigh the potential negative consequences. But if an outside party interfered, the law stepped in to offer remedies to the slave's master, if the master determined that the sexual act was not in his interest. And the key word here is master. <clears throat> I'm sure you've noted that while all of the available charges present different rationales for the harm in sexual violation, they have in common the perceived victim, the master. I found only one place in the legal sources in which a jurist admits, and this is in the case of physical but non-sexual injury, that the slave might personally experience harm and that that in and of itself makes the injury worthy of retribution. Sorry, I don't have a slide for this one, but I quote, even if the beating of a slave was not directed at the master, that is, it was not intended to dishonor the master, 
The outrage perpetrated upon the slave as such should not be left unavenged, for it is obvious that the slave himself feels such things. I think it's pretty telling that this comment is even noteworthy, but it, it is noteworthy, actually. So the issue of the identity of the victim brings me to my final consideration, which you may have noticed is a major absence thus far, and that's the nature of the sexual acts that are of concern to a master. Although I use rape in my title, I have since avoided using it <laughs> to describe the offense for which these actions offer retribution. This is the peril of writing a title before you write the paper. <laughs> the consent of the slave in a sexual encounter in these legal sources is ambiguous. We know that Roman law considered consent to be a relevant factor in evaluating a sexual act among three persons because, for example, a married woman who is raped by enemy soldiers does not commit adultery. But the laws on slaves do not specify whether this act is consensual. On the face of it, we might consider the sex exploitative. The slave is almost never described as the agent or initiator of the action, but we have the complicating factor that the Latin sexual vocabulary represents the penetrated partner, as the slave would likely be in either homosexual or heterosexual encounters, as the recipient of the action. Similarly, some of the words used to describe the sexual act connote force, but again, the Latin sexual vocabulary, as the English, is not necessarily literal. And as I'm sure you are especially all aware, evaluation of consent, trust, and intimacy in sexual relationships located within the power structure of slavery is difficult even with the most detailed information. What we can say is that the level of coercion involved and the consent of the slave did not determine whether the act was illicit. It is only the will of the master. And since it is the absence of the master's consent that makes this sexual act illegal, these charges gave the master the means not only to exact retribution for the rape of a slave, but also the means to punish consensual sexual relationships formed by his slaves with freeborn or freed persons. Whether motivated by a desire to exploit the slave's reproductive capacity, to assert control by interfering with self-initiated familial relations, for whatever reason, these laws allowed the, the master to manipulate the sexuality of his slaves in all circumstances. So in conclusion, the claim that the sexual vulnerability of slaves is codified in Roman law requires more refinement. We can agree that a slave had no sexual autonomy. Any ability to control this area of their life came via the will of the master. It's not autonomy. But the position of the slave in Roman law as both property and person, and the division of Roman law into a system of actions, accommodated sexual exploitation in a very broad sense by leaving any determination of the slave's sexual honor in the hands of the master rather than dictating its absence. An owner might wish to give some slaves the ability to determine their own sexual relationships, for example, those in positions of trust like an overseer or business manager. He might wish to enforce or defend the chastity of others, for example, the companions of the female members of the family or potentially his own offspring by a slave. He might wish to orchestrate slave unions for the purpose of breeding or control. He might wish to keep a slave as a personal concubine. He might wish to give the sexual services of a slave to a friend or patron, as presumably was going to happen in the case of Virginia. By allowing the master to determine the value of a slave's sexuality based on the slave's relationship to him, function in the household, public presence, and any factor he deems relevant. The legal system gave him the ability to harness a slave's sexuality, to harness it, manipulate it, control it, in whatever way he deemed most advantageous. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, Mick, for two uh, excellent papers that raise a number of issues for us to think about. I gather that my role here is to comment briefly on the two papers and then to turn the floor back over to Emanuela, perhaps, to field other questions. Uh, so I think I'll, I'll start, if I may, uh, in reverse order. I have a couple of thoughts for Catherine specific to her paper and a couple for Mick specific to his. And then I'll, I'll conclude with a thought that um, may be more closely directed to Mick's paper in the, the narrow sense, but I think applies to both and maybe a, a way I, I can open up the conversation more generally to a, an, a common denominator, I think, in the two papers. 
Catherine, uh, thank you very much. I, I, you, I think you can all see, even if you knew nothing about this before coming into the room, that the Roman law about sexuality of slaves is quite complex, and it requires a number of uh, points of nuance. Uh, Catherine focused today on the issue of chastity and its potential value, and is quite right, I think, in drawing attention to the fact that it's purely in the eye or the mind or the will of the master. I think part of the question uh, that you raised it briefly at the end about whether a slave uh, ex had a free will, whether a slave expressed consensual uh, agreement to a sexual relationship, is a, is a moot one really in Roman law because regardless of the human realities, and that's constantly what the jurists are straining against, slaves were regarded as having no free agency and no will of their own. So it's not as much a matter of depriving a possibility of free consent as not acknowledging the possibility that it could be given if a slave is conceived of in the hypothetical sense as having no free will whatsoever, even the decision about whether to consent to sexual relations or not, at least in the conception, is thought to be not something possible. Um, two points very basically, I'll just mention that the, the monetary evaluation of a slave as being somehow worse than a free person is quite old in Roman law, as Catherine knows. It goes back all the way to the middle of the fifth century BCE our oldest uh, Roman law document, the so-called Twelve Tables, which are something like the Ten Commandments, and tables in this uh, lingu lingo correspond really to the idea of individual uh, tablets, one per law. And a couple of those concern slavery. Uh, one of them quite, not, not sexuality in slavery, but damage to slave, which is the, the main law under which uh, violations of chastity come up. And there too, as you know, there's a distinction between punishments for a violation of free persons and violation of slaves on which always the slave is uh, assigned a monetary value and it's uh, regarded as less than a free person. This is familiar, I think, to all of us from a uh, study of all slave societies, a kind of systematic devaluation of the uh, value of, of the slave. Uh, likewise, the, the realities, despite the jurists' uh, conniptions about uh, speci you know, specific cases of whether a, a value of a slave was uh, diminished or not, uh, the philosopher Seneca, as a, again, I'm sure Catherine knows this famous uh, epigrammatic quote, in the middle of the first century CE, uh, commented that stuprum, and that was the technical term that Catherine put up in the, the uh, first slide, uh, she shied away from it at the end, mentioning that rape was brought up only in the, uh, in the introduction, and that's quite proper, as she knows full well. Stuprum is a nice, convenient, generic term in Roman law for any kind of unnatural sexual relation, any kind. Anything perceived as other than heterosexual, normal sex uh, was open to a potential charge of stuprum. So it really, we don't need to specify details. It was a nice, convenient, legal catch-all category. And Seneca, the philosopher, in one of his uh, letters, comments that uh, stuprum, that is submitting to any one of these uh, illicit sexual activities, should be regarded as a disgrace in a free person, an obligation in a freedman, and a duty in a slave, or a necessity in a slave. Just quite there, the simple hierarchy, uh, showing the, the different social attitudes attached to the same act, depending upon the free will. And you notice it's only the, the character in that hierarchy that's thought to have a free, independent autonomy, the free person, for whom submitting to stuprum is a positive disgrace. In a sense, along with the systematic devaluation in legal terms, there's a recognition that uh, the possibility of honor uh, is also removed with the possibility of having free will from the slave. So it's not a disgrace for a slave to, to commit one of these acts. He had no choice. Uh, for a freedman, it's regarded as somewhere in between. But the obligation, as Mick mentioned, these were among the duties that ex-slaves owed to their master. Uh, this kind of thing would fall into that very ambivalent and large gray area between actual freedom um, and still an obligation, for example, manumitted uh, mistresses were obliged to continue having sexual relations with their patrons, uh, their former masters, if that was their wish. So freedom was uh, conditional in terms of their sexual autonomy. Finally, um, apart from a comment, a, a challenge, a question on one aspect that I wanted to see if you would consider a little further, perhaps, Catherine. You mentioned at one point your use of the gendered pronouns in talking about male masters and female slaves, and no doubt that conforms to the tendency of the juristic passages you cited and so on. Uh, and you, you quite rightly commented that the laws apply to both genders, and there were, of course, female slave owners uh, who owned male and female slaves, and also legally had the same rights of sexual availability and accessibility to their slaves. But there was a different code. 
And whereas we can find in one of the passages Catherine put up, a passage of Horace, uh, the poet living around the time of Augustus, commenting that when a man feels like having sex, he should just grab a slave nearby. It's convenient and easy, and isn't this uh, a less damaging than in, in adultery, is this really what he's contrasting it with. It's definitely a man that he's talking about, and he would make no such suggestion that a free woman should behave similarly. So uh, I'd be interested to get your, hear your thoughts on how that gendering, which did not affect the slaves, as you quite rightly note, uh, the violation of a, the sexual integrity of a slave is independent of the gender of the slave or even the nature of the violation. Uh, whether it's heterosexual, homosexual, any form of stuprum is equally considered the same under the law. And yet for a free person, gender makes a huge difference as to how a particular sexual act would be regarded. Uh, so there's a, a, a dichotomy, if you'd like, in the gendering between slave and free. Turning to Mick, if I may, um, and a couple of specific comments first, Mick. Again, thank you for your very far-reaching uh, overview of the assimilation of slavery and poverty, really, in antiquity, uh, which is, is certainly prevalent in both Greek and Roman thought. In a couple of places, the, the evidence you were citing for uh, Serwitium, the, the literary passages, I think is probably more metaphorical than literal. Uh, when Juvenal talks about the long servitium of turning up uh, as a client at his master's door and being turned away. It's, it's metaphorical, but that is, this is good grist for your mill, I think. It doesn't diminish your point, uh, but to be careful to not take things that might be metaphorical in the language. Uh, the elegiac poets, uh, make a, uh, all of whom are aristocrats, make a trope of uh, claiming their servitium amoris, their, ser their servitude to their mistresses. I'm a slave to the love of you, and it has a technical term. So that, that concept of slavery was widely used metaphorically, um, as I'm sure you know. Uh, likewise, the reference uh, in the, the legal passage you had to a husband being accused of pimping uh, for not uh, prosecuting an adulterous wife, I think there, and you were drawing a conclusion about economic circumstances from it, there too, and Catherine could perhaps help with this, but I, I think what's probably lying behind that is not actual profit making, but the provisions of this Lex Julia that Catherine put up, uh, one of the Julian laws passed around the turn of the Common Era regarding uh, adultery specifically, de adulteriis, in which it was declared that a husband who was cognizant of his wife's adulterous behavior, who did not divorce her, would be passively, tacitly uh, uh, complicit as pimping for her. It was really an effort to try to regulate the sanctity of marriage by forcing husbands to divorce wives who had been unfaithful to them. And a husband who decided he'd rather look the other way, he'd rather, he loved her, he still wanted to stay with her, would be accused and could be accused of actually pimping for her, even if no money was exchanged. Uh, which, which, and I think this might be the case behind the legal passage you cited. Uh, it may not be, but it raises an interesting question about this perception as well, uh, and what Augustus was trying to do in his social legislation. Finally, to come to the main point, um, that I think the unifying idea that, that is common to both, and I'm sure it's come up at earlier parts of the conversation today and will tomorrow, the importance of uh, self-control, self-determination in the status, real and imagined, real and legal, real and constructed, of slaves and free persons. Autonomy is a word that Catherine used quite frequently, and it really is lurking behind a lot of what Nick was talking about as well, and ancient attitudes towards poverty and labor. Um, people who have to work for, for wages are, are not autonomous. They're equally closely allied to that uh, paragon of, of accomplishment and virtue in antiquity, autonomy, was self-sufficiency, a close, close second to it. And in that regard, Nick, I think it's probably worth drawing a distinction uh, among the poor, spoken of generically in Roman culture, between the rural poor, many of whom are peasant farmers, and whom Roman social attitudes never had a problem with. That was a dignified form of poverty. They worked the land. And Romans' own self-serving ideological myths had it that their own founding fathers were yeoman farmers working the land with their own hands. So they were comfortable enough with that idea. All the passages you happen to cite, and I believe probably others that you might have cited would bear this out, are focused on the urban plebs. And these were the unemployed poor of the city, the megalopolis of Rome who were a, a persistent political problem precisely because they were not gainfully employed even in working subsistence farm plots. And they were a political threat and it, it's they that are regularly assimilated to slaves and likened to them. So maybe one, uh, one distinction to draw there. 
Uh, what I'd like to do in closing, as I, I mentioned, is to read a, a briefly a passage of uh, the German philosopher Nietzsche that touches on the issue of labor, uh, particularly, and slavery, but more importantly about autonomy and self-sufficiency. And it comes from an unpublished uh, preface of his uh, to an unwritten book uh, called The Greek State. And I'll just read briefly, if I may, a couple of excerpts, and Mick will see immediately the relevance of them, I think. But they, I'm hoping that they might open up the conversation a bit further by bringing into, into the mix the thought of a 19th century German philosopher uh, working through these same texts and these same problems. He's talking about the Greeks, but what he says about the Greeks would hold for the Romans as well. We moderns have an advantage over the Greeks in two ideas, which are given, as it were, as a compensation to a world behaving thoroughly slavishly, and yet at the same time anxiously eschewing the word slave. We talk of the dignity of man and the dignity of labor. Everybody writes in order, worries in order miserably to perpetuate a miserable existence. This awful need compels man to consuming labor. He, or more exactly the human intellect, seduced by the will, quote unquote, now occasionally marvels at labor as something dignified. And I omit a bit. The Greeks did not require such conceptual hallucinations. For among them, the idea that labor is a disgrace is expressed with startling frankness. And another piece of wisdom, more hidden and less articulate, but everywhere alive, added that the human thing was also an ignominious and piteous nothing and the dream of a shadow. And then I omit more along that vein and, and come to my final part of the quote. Uh, now we have the general idea, says Nietzsche, to which are to be subordinated the feelings which the Greeks had with regard to labor and slavery. He's talked about slavery in the interim. Both were considered by them as a necessary disgrace, of which one feels a shame as a disgrace and as a necessity at the same time. And that concept, that concept of slavery is a necessary disgrace precisely because it draws attention to the, the need for autonomy and self-sufficiency and the human condition. Humans need to grow plants to eat. They need to live. This is what Nietzsche is talking about. And that's an indignity of man who should be, in Nietzsche's idea, uh, devoted to purely aesthetic thoughts of the mind. And the fact that men have to labor to support themselves is what Nietzsche thought the Greeks were talking about in assimilating labor and the lack of autonomy and self-sufficiency uh, to slavery itself, the two being equivalent in his mind. So thank you both for, for stimulating papers. I enjoyed them very much, and I hope to hear further thoughts from you about these and other matters. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Any other questions or comments? Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah but they're both in great papers. I learned a lot about Roman uh, society, which uh, I knew nothing about before. So plus one. Um, I, my, so my question is going to be, I mean, it's unavoidable or I make a comparison to American or uh, Central America, the United States, uh, especially about mix, uh, especially about slavery and poverty, it reminded me a lot of the situation in Colony, Virginia, um, where, uh, you know, the major threat in the 17th century to the social order as perceived by the elites was not just black slaves, but these uh, wild bachelors, you know, like these uh, white guys who, uh, you know, came across the ocean, uh, you know, as adventurers, they were uh, free from the adventures, uh, but they found, you know, land was so scarce, but they really want to land, and they started, you know, talking rebellion and fomenting rebellion. Um, but the outcome there, uh, the, the end of that story is, you know, um, uh, the formation of racial slavery and also the formation of republicanism as a way of uh, granting uh, these uh, uh, poor uh, white uh, men a kind of a measure of uh, a place in the political order uh, because they were white. You know, they were free because they're white and not black. Um, what's the outcome in, in your story? I mean, uh, so where does this? Uh, you know, you say that uh, you know the rhetoric uh, around poverty and slavery uh, was a reflection and seems like also a uh, instrument of a kind of a political disenfranchisement of the urban poor. Uh, how does that play out? I mean, this is due to the rest of your dissertation. Uh, sort of what happens to the poor in the, uh, in the Roman uh, Republic of Empire? Um, well, um, I, guess, I guess two points. The first point you made about um, 
threat the indentured servitude, uh, servants play in Virginia. Um, much like the, the burghers of Virginia, uh, the Roman aristocracy was very afraid of social mobility. Um, and like the revolt, which you mentioned, are like social mobility the extreme, that the entire social order will be toppled. Um, that never actually happens in the Roman state. There is no real threat of that. Um, and what threats there are uh, tend to be, well, either in the form of slave revolts, but that's only in very localized places at very localized times. Um, but there's never an enfranchisement of the freedmen, never like a, a solid legal one. Um, there is some mediating things uh, in personal relationships, but never uh, a culture-wide enfranchisement. In terms of like what happens in the end, yeah. like do, do the poor ever get their compromise? Do they ever get a, sh a share of the pie? The short answer is no. Um, but one of the overarching threads of my dissertation that I hope to prove is that um, there is an increase in social compassion towards the poor, toward legalized culture-wide institutions that support the poor. The Romans had had cultural institutions of uh, support of poor citizens from the very beginning, well, at least from the early, from the middle republic, in the forms of grain distributions and other sorts of prizes and tokens that one got as part of citizenship but it was always figured as part of citizenship. Now, the increased respect toward the poor over time, I think will dovetail neatly with the Christian era, which elevates the status of poverty to something that's much higher than it had ever been. Um, and so hopefully the conclusion that I will reach is that that was not as abrupt of a stop, of a slip strike fault as in California, a very right right terminology, um, as it might seem. So that's kind of, That actually brings up a really interesting historical circumstance, which is that the one time that we, or at least one time in Roman society when we do see the poor aligning themselves with the slaves in terms of revolts is in Sicily, um, which were, was full of large plantation style farms. Um, but interestingly, the, those who join the revolt are these bachelor, wild bachelors, they're these um, shepherds and herders who are not living in family units and who are mostly young men. So, I think, that's, yeah. <laughs> yes? Uh, I guess coercive sexuality with male slaves. What would be an example of an instance for, I'm thinking immediately, of, well, if there was a Roman matron who's a widow, uh, was she able to coercively enforce or force her male slaves to have sex with her and there would be no penalty in, in law, she would be seen as, what kind, can you give a hypothetical and actual example of something? Yeah, um, yeah this relates to Professor Bodell's question. Um, in the law, when female masters having sex with their own slaves does not come up. However, we do see a concern about women having sex with <coughs> other people's male slaves. <laughs> And I think that the concern we see here is a concern for the status of the children. Because in Roman law, the child follows the status of the mother. Therefore, these children, this offspring of slaves and free women would be free themselves. And that is clearly an issue for the Romans because they actually changed this law so that the children are enslaved in this case and the mother also might be enslaved. Which I recently read is also the case in Maryland at a certain point, interestingly. Um, so I think that a lot, there is certainly, as Professor Bodell was saying, there is perhaps partly a concern for this sexual honor of women um, in this idea of like the Mediterranean honor shame culture. That's one popular explanation for this idea that women had, there was double standard. But I think there's also a very specific economic side of things, which is that legitimate children, um, free children would be able to inherit you know, free enslaved children had no legal connection um, to their parents. So I think that is a primary concern. And um, so legally, we don't see that appear, women with their own slaves. Yeah. I have a question about liability, mm -hmm. um, or a point of clarification. So if Master A slave rapes Master B slave, is Master A liable 
uh, to master B, or what's the kind of framework that right. handles the situation like that? Or even if, or even if it's consensual, uh, right. slave we, sex. We wouldn't, we wouldn't know. Yeah. Um, so uh, a master can, in some situations, be liable for the actions of his own slave. Um, I, we suspect that in most cases, this um, that these things might have been dealt with by the owners because the owner had rights over their slave to do whatever they wanted. Um, I think, again, that's an issue in terms of who is uh, the owner of the offspring of the slaves. Um, and I think that's why that would be considered an issue. Um, but yeah, certainly um, that would be, that could be a problem if the master chose to see it as a problem. <laughs> I have a question for Mick. Yeah. Um, so I know you mostly talked about, because of your analysis, the kind of lowliest types of slaves, the ones that are performing labor and the kind of the most menial tasks. But as you indicated in your social pyramid too, one of the kind of interesting and weird things about the Roman slave society is the fact that there were slaves, so legally they're in the same status of these, as these lowly slaves, but they are up and kind of peeking into the upper echelons, especially those of the familia Caesaris, the ones that were imperial slaves that were usually not performing these kinds of labors. There were various kinds of administrators, and many of them, as we know, acquired quite a bit of wealth. They had quite a bit of, well, autonomy or, or uh, degrees of, um, yeah. Um, so how do you think, or what do we know about Roman elite perceptions of these slaves? These people? Um, well, um, like one of the best examples of this is the Emperor Claudius has a couple freedmen named Pallas and Narcissus or his bosom buddies whom he basically trusts with the administration of the empire. He thinks it's great. Uh, the rest of Roman society thinks it's a terrible scandal. It's a complete disgrace that he's letting these people who were of servile origin run the state. And it's not only a disgrace to the state, it's a disgrace to the emperor himself. Because, well, one, he should be exercising this power. And if he's not exercising this power, he should be delegating it to members of the elite order who have traditionally served in these roles before, uh, mostly in inefficient unofficial capacity, uh, but it went over terribly, all right? Um, and it's hard to know exactly how it went over at the time because we don't have exactly contemporary reports. Uh, Tacitus is a generation or two afterwards, but it's utterly scathing denunciation. Um, they are horrible, disgraceful characters. One winds up sleeping with the empress and being complicit in the murder of the emperor. It's, it's a horror story. I'm sure they thought of it differently. <laughs> I want to thank the two of you and also the, the respondent for an incredibly st stimulating uh, panel. Inte intellectually, I think the question of, uh, of the perception of work, of, of labor, was uh, very uh, in interesting. I had a question for, for Mick. Um, would it be possible for you to, to give me some insight into how the Roman view uh, agricultural uh, labor? And I ask this question because I am interested in um, one of the challenge of uh, post-emancipation uh, French colonies was precisely to transform the perception of uh, agricultural labor in former slaves. Uh, so, um, but there was a, eventually there was a tension between, um, or should I say a rejection of agricultural labor um, and a preference for more intellectual labor in, uh, in, uh, in French society. So I was curious to see how the Roman view uh, agricultural labor, because it, it is very, I mean, in the 19th century, in 19th century France, agricultural labor was, would, will be seen as something very valuable for the society. So. Um, yeah, when I talked at the very, when I said at the very beginning of my talk about modes of representation of poverty, um, and uh, Dr. Fidel also mentioned between urban and rural plebs. The Romans never lost their idealization of the yeoman farmer who embodies all the traditional virtues of the Roman society. You know, frugality, hard work, labor, self-sufficiency. But 
while they idealized this image, they did not put it into practice in any way, shape, or form. They continued to idealize this while they bought up land in large estates and um, displaced thousands and thousands of peasant farmers who became the urban plebs, whom they had a bitter distaste for in many circumstances. So it is a, a large scale image of cognitive dissonance in a certain sense, but the respect for this traditional legendary image of the Roman as the peasant farmer never goes away. And we see lots of images of it in history, in uh, bucolic, aggressive poetry. It's all over the culture, right? And they, they never stop liking it, even while they're causing it to not exist anymore. So it's a, like a persistent cultural image. evidence or, or cases of slave women using um, beauty or the art of seduction as a mechanism for social mobility, even maybe out of slavery? Um, yes, definitely. Um, it was actually fairly common to free your slaves so that you can marry your slave. Um, and we have uh, funerary documents that um, show this because they say to my um, patron and husband. Um, we don't know when the relationship started, of course, and we don't have the perspective of slaves. And it's really hard for me to be at this conference because all of you guys have these wonderful narratives that I don't have. <laughs> um, I will give you one example, though, the only example I found of a slave's voice about this, really, uh, about a sexual relationship with a free person that suggests it might have been beneficial for her. Um, the the um, Republican uh, politician, Crassus, is hidden in a cave uh, in Spain while he's um, hiding from political enemies. And the person who owns the property sends two slave women to tend to him in the cave. And uh, it's explicitly said that they're there for sexual purposes. Interestingly, um, the person who's recording, this historian who's recording this story says, many years later, the slave talked about how she remembered that incident with fondness. And I mean, I just keep thinking about that passage today because you know it brings up all the questions we talked about earlier with these narratives. Who's asking the question? Is she representing her feelings at the time? I mean, it's just so confusing. But that's sort of the issue is we don't know if slaves chose um, actively to use, to harness this power for advancement. But it certainly seems that they could have if they were willing to. I had a question on the slide you put up about the indignity of labor for for the the, the citizen, or I guess for the for the uh, aristocrat, I guess mm -hmm. specifically. And the term mercenary seemed to be oh, yeah. the black term. So I'm curious about how the notion of military service is parsed between that that perception as an insider outsider, whether it's legitimate service or for an elite person or not. Right. Okay, so the Latin word mercenarius. Uh, literally means anyone who works for a wage. And uh, usually connoting physical labor has not, to my knowledge, zero to no actual military connotations. Uh, there are other words for mercenaries in the, the Roman, the Greco-Roman world. Um, but the fact that you are earning a wage for services like a later mercenary would probably is the reason for the, um, the presence of that term. It gets adopted and, and changed later in Latinate languages. Um, I don't know if Dr. Vidal. Yes, I think that's right. I mean, our, our idea of mercenaries, it's been specialized to be military mercenaries, but originally, as Mick is saying, it really meant anyone who worked for wages. Yeah, and like the connotation that this is a little bit more degrading um, than a mercenary has versus a regular soldier is, I think, perhaps yeah. um, a continuation of this uh, attitude towards labor. Kat, since I, I've seen the HBO show Rome, so I'm pretty much an expert. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Vic mentioned, I think your story, that the anecdote you just shared, you mentioned it was a Republican politician, and Mick was talking about his broader project. He's tracing this change over time. And I'm wondering if you're seeing, I'm a historian, so I, I just think change over time. Uh, I'm wondering, that's just my go-to, if you're 
if your uh, uh, sexual politics and, and law uh, is also undergoing similar changes from I don't know, Republic to Emperor or whatever it might be for Rome. Yes, definitely. Um, there's uh, a book that just came out about this, actually, um, from Shame to Sin by Kyle Harper. Um, certainly with the advent of Christianity, attitudes towards sex, sex, sexuality completely change, and we therefore, um, we do see in law greater protections for slaves, maybe humanitarian, maybe not, um, but another, nevertheless, there's rules about, for instance, slaves being sold into prostitution, and you see that there is this idea that comes out, even in the legal sources, that a master who sells his slave into prostitution is shaming himself as well as the slave. Um, however, and I, I might disagree a little bit with Mick here, um, the, you do start to see slaves being lumped in with um, other lower classes. In this, there's this legal distinction that's created, uh, the, the lower classes, the humiliores and the honestores, the upper classes, and you, this is like enshrined in law so that all the lower classes have worse punishments for the same crimes as upper classes. So while you do see a change in attitude, um, I, I think it's difficult in some senses to tell if it's a, a different attitude towards slavery in particular. Our speakers and our discussant and all of you.